Good morning. It's good to be back with you here for uh, divine service this week. I missed last week. Uh, thanks for your patience. We went through a bunch of, we didn't have surgery. We actually went through a bunch of tests for Naomi uh, and then actually determined this week that she still needs surgery. Uh, so I'm actually, we're going to drive back after Bible class today to Cincinnati and have surgery tomorrow. So your prayers are welcome for that. But it's good to be here today to be edified before, um, before all of that. Uh, I don't have Ethan, no organist today, so sorry. He's in Nebraska um, at school. So he starts on Monday as well. That's tomorrow. Though, you maybe shouldn't be too envious of him. Uh, it's going to be 104 there tomorrow. So would you rather just sing along with recording or be in Nebraska in 104 degrees? Hmm. Uh, Trade-offs, right? Good. Today, um, we're going to actually change divine service setting, but not to one that you don't know, but to one that you probably know if you've been around any length of time pretty well. Divine service setting three. This was old page uh, five or 15 from the Lutheran hymnal. So I think it'll be pretty easy for us to sing a cappella, certainly easier than the one we've been using, service one. So that's why. But let's begin with a hymn of invocation from Depth of Woe, I Cry to Thee, hymn 607.
invite you to stand. Again, our divine service follows the order of divine service setting three, page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Continue to sing the intro as we have been, that is, half verse by half verse, but you'll have to remember to come in, the organist won't let you know that, okay? God is in his holy habitation. He settles the solitary in our home. The God of Israel, he is the one who gives power and strength to his people. God shall arise his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. But the righteous shall be glad, they shall exalt before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. O God, when you went out before your people, in your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. God is in his holy habitation. He settles the solitary in our home. The God of Israel, he is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Lord, have mercy on 
upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father, our Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord, thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things that we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 11th Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. 
When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, No, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked God says, What right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice 
glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. The Epistles from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in trespasses and in sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Stand for the Holy Gospel. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. 
confess together the Nicene Creed and show love for one another thereby. I believe in one God, the Father.
In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. This is the word of the Lord that came to me, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. My brothers and sisters, we are here, though drenched in the blood of Cain's ancient question, his words echoing through all the corridors of time like a gunshot in the night. Am I my brother's keeper? Or maybe we should phrase it this way. Are we our brother's keepers? It's a question that cuts through to flesh and bone, exposing the raw nerve of our nature, especially in the realization that at every opportunity we have taken our Lord's gifts for granted. We strut upon this sacred earth, exploiting one another, with cunning smiles and calculated schemes under disguise of what's lawful and what we say is right and wrong. Our desires morph into obsessions and we dare to murder not just in the flesh, but the very life of fellowship and brotherhood, the very community that God has given us, our congregation. Even here, hungrily seizing for our selfish purposes what God has not given to us. When someone is hurt or harmed by our choices, we have the audacity dripping on our lips to cry out to God like Cain, how is this my problem? But remember when the mighty floodwaters swallowed the wickedness of old, and yet we, the new progeny of Noah, tread down the same path. In the same way, the Tower of Babel stands as a testament against our arrogance too. As, we, as they sought to pierce the heavens themselves, so do we, to storm heaven by force, to declare what we think is righteous, good, and true. But what did God do with those floodwaters or to those who built the tower? Our language was twisted, our unity was scattered, and God scattered us to the winds. It was our fault. But what did we learn? Do we not still try to build up our own towers today, again, constructed from the bricks of our own pride and the mortar of our self-indulgence? So we aren't all that different from those that we meet in the scriptures. They are our brothers and sisters too. Like the serpent in Eden's garden, we echo those half-truths, hissing them into the ears of our brothers and sisters. Sowing discord and conflict shattering trust. We shun our Lord's divine commands. We sculpt our own golden calves from our desires. And then we smirk too and turn around to the creator and demand, why have you forsaken us? We are so arrogant, petulant, and pitiful, like rebellious children. The ground beneath our feet trembles and the earth itself bears witness to our insolent rebellion, and yet, How do we react? We dance with the devil and then wail when the flames lick at our heels. And that gets to the heart of the matter. We are the architects of our own misfortune, the builders of our own personal hells. We revel in our excess. We gorge on what God has forbidden, those fruits. Or to say it this way, we shun God's word and his gifts prioritizing our own wants, our own things over others' needs. We look the other way when someone is weak and fallen, saying, well, how sad, how tragic, or how disgusting. But when the final reckoning arrives and God's furious anger breathes upon us, withering our spirits, afflicting our bodies, our lives, even the things that we have been trying to build, then we cry foul, how could God forsake us? and point our fingers up to the heavens, demanding that God apologize to us for what he has done to us. Don't believe me? How about this? Listen, maybe you've heard these sorts of things. Our church closed because we couldn't pay the bills. We didn't support the pastor and his family or the teachers. We didn't show up to worship when our brothers and sisters because we had better things to do. But, oh, why has God forsaken us? Why do our family and friends, especially our congregation, turn away from us? They don't call. They don't text. They treat us coldly at family parties. How could God allow this? 
We become weak and fall, and there's no one to pick us up. We ask for help, and no one answers our pleas. Well, God damn them for not helping me when we cry. And so we're like Abel, with his blood crying out from the ground, a haunting refrain that echoes also through the corridors of time. Are we our brother's keepers? And the answer, my friends, is etched in our own deeds. We answer that rhetorical question with our choices and by our very souls. Cain's question demands a reckoning, an answer, a grappling with the reality of our own humanity like fallen Cain. We, the prodigal sons and daughters, must stare deep into the mirror of our own actions, cast aside our arrogance and embrace the divine mandate to love one another, to show charity. Because in the end, as the dust settles and the smoke clears, the truth remains. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, because Jesus suffered, died, and was raised from the dead to redeem you, his brothers and sisters. So if they are worth God's life, if he died for them, if he kept them safe from sin, death, and hell, then they're worth your sacrificing for too. But are any of you ready and willing to do this, to be your brother's keeper? Let me, let me give you a hypothetical and see how this will work out based off of past experience. If, for example, you are ordered to stay home because of another virus outbreak, let's say in December, just in time for Christmas, will you comply? Knowing what you know now, three years later, Will you forsake your church and your fellow brothers and sisters here who need to hear your songs and prayers and thanksgiving, especially as we celebrate together the birth of Jesus, the one who actually gives life over death? Or when the demand comes, it will be enough of an excuse for you to turn away from family and friends, to treat them as potential virus spreaders, potential killers. Will you isolate yourself from your brothers and sisters to make yourself feel safe? That might be a good time to ask the question again, am I my brother's keeper? And if, you, if not you, then who is? If Christians can't even do this, even though we have a clear mandate from God, who will? Who will be my brother's keeper? Who will protect me and my family from you who forsake me? Who will defend this church and preserve the preaching of the gospel and administration of the sacraments here, even in a time of crisis? Who will bend down and pick up your brother and sister when they're weak and fallen, even when they make a tragic mistake? It must be Jesus, and Jesus actually who keeps us, defends us, and protects us. We are his brother, and he never fails us. And of course, God must do this because we lack the faith, courage, and strength to do it. And if not Jesus, then who else will rescue us from Cain's fate? Who else can put a mark on our forehead, a sign of the Holy Cross, to save us from death? There's no one else coming to help us because we already stand in the aftermath of our own handiwork, unwilling and unable to take responsible for all the ways we've sinned against our brothers and sisters. Every man, woman on earth, including us, stands on this ground, scarred by our recklessness and cowardice. Cities of vanity rise like monuments to our fleeting desires, and the cries of those desperate in need are drowned out by the cacophony of, well, what we think we want, our excess. Knowing no one else is coming to help us because we've all grown skilled at evading responsibility and crafting excuses to absolve ourselves from staring at the consequences of our own actions in the thorny crowned face of Jesus. So the words of Eden's rebellion still spill out of our mouths day after day, a confession of sin about the choices we've made and the paths we've taken that take us farther and farther away from God. And yet, then when God meets out his divine justice against us with thunderclouds and lightning, we dive for cover. We dare to shake our fists at the sky, proclaiming, why, O oh God, have you forsaken us? 
rather than acknowledging it's our own damn fault. So ask yourself, what if God adopted the same attitude? What if God's answer to us was, why have I forsaken you? I don't know, am I your keeper? Should I treat you the way you treat your own brothers and sisters? Do I abandon you the way that you've abandoned me? <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine if that's the sort of God we had. Our churches would be even emptier than they are, already are. But again, here's the revelation of Calvary's cross and the only anecdote for our rebellion to what God has given. God never abandons or forsakes us. He remains amidst the struggles and chaos of our own making, amidst the debris of our shattered promises. He comes and over and over calls us to repentance, shows us our sins, to forgive those sins and to lead us again into the way of life and eternity. As we flip through the pages of the scriptures, maybe Gospel of Mark would be a good one. There's a beacon of truth that emerges. Jesus responds to Cain and to all of us by declaring us his kin when we put our trust in him. He says to us, you are my brothers and sisters. That's God's answer to Cain's lingering query. Yes, you are your brother's keeper because I am yours. I will be your guardian, your keeper, and your brethren too. Because what seems insurmountable for you is well within my grasp. I can even make children of Abraham out of these stones, he says. So, brothers and sisters, as we consider the audacity of Cain's question, am I my brother's keeper? We are simultaneously grasped by the unfailing truth that in the arms of our Savior Jesus, we find the answers we, we so desperately need. No longer do we cry out, why have you forsaken us? Instead, we are embraced by the unyielding, resounding affirmation that we are not forsaken, that we are indeed our brother's keeper through the boundless love of Jesus Christ. And unlike how you treat me, and I treat you, and we treat one another, God does not desert us in our hour of need. So as we strut and stumble through life, and we are called to pay attention to the fact that our brothers and sisters aren't there for us to exploit, to misuse, to ignore, or to leave for dead. They are instruments of God's grace and mercy. Through their struggles and sacrifices, God is at work in us to create and redeem life for them, to forge strength for them in adversity, and to give us objects for whom we can love. So when you look into your brothers and sisters' eyes, be it here among the household of faith or even in your own family or in this world, remember that you are gazing into the face of God himself because you are seeing someone for whom Jesus triumphed over death, someone whom Jesus loves and has saved. You are seeing someone who needs a brother to help them climb out of the ditch into which they've fallen. The person in front of you is a mirror God holds up to you to reveal, this one, this brother, is an embodiment of my redemption song of victory. Love him as I have loved you. Sacrifice for him as I have sacrificed my life to redeem you. This is why I've created you. This is the Christian mission. And this is why I call you my brothers and sisters, that you may love each other as I have loved you. This is the word of the Lord that came to me so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name alone. Amen. I invite you to stand, and we'll sing the offertory. I have to remember everything that we do at this service, too.
Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Be merciful to us, Heavenly Father, for daily we are tempted by Satan, and daily we sin and transgress your will. For the sake of Christ Jesus and his bitter suffering and death upon the cross, forgive us. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to your church here and in every place. Defend our pastors from arrogance and pride and strengthen them in the faithful preaching of your word, that both your holy law and your precious gospel would be proclaimed and your children be united in saving faith. We pray also in particular for our district president, John Willie, who is undergoing treatment for cancer, that he would be delivered from death. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to all in need, especially children who lack food, clothing, and shelter, and all orphans in need of parents to care for them. We ask you to consider and to implore our hearts to provide for those in need in Maui and elsewhere where there is disaster, that they would be provided for in their time of need. Heavenly Father, provide earthly fathers, mothers, friends, and neighbors to care for them and give us generosity to serve as agents of your mercy and love to all those in need. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be merciful to our land that those with any authority would exercise it with wisdom and righteousness, and that we would have peaceful days. Be merciful to the nations of the world that wars would cease and harmony be restored. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to the sick, the sorrowing, and the recovering, especially Joe, Melanie, Kelsey, Christopher, Marcy, Brad, Eileen, and Ron, Doug, Bev, Donna, Jim, Pat, Wendell, and Darlene, Naomi, who will be having surgery tomorrow, our homebound Marcy, Marion, Dan, Paul, Dolores, Merlin, and Pauline that as they are burdened by the difficulties and hardships of life in this fallen world, they would receive not only temporal relief, but know the forgiveness of their sins and have the constant hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful, O Lord, to all those who rejoice in your many gifts, especially this week, praying with those celebrating their birthday, Jerry, Nicole, Dan, Michael, and Heaven, those who rejoice in the gift of new life and baptism, Linda, Kayleen, and Richard. Those who will celebrate wedding anniversaries, Dale and Anne, Russ and Amy, Keith and Tammy. Indeed, we pray for all the households of our church, but especially this week with David, Sylvia, Kevin, William, and Eugene. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, be merciful to our neighbors, especially those who have sinned against us and done us harm. Give us patience and strength to deal with them gently and humbly, readily forgiving as we have been forgiven. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to those who commune this day, that they may receive the forgiveness of their sins in this blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, if we trust in ourselves for righteousness, we are lost and dead in our sins. Yet you mercifully draw us to yourself in repentance and hear the cries of those who trust in your Son. Grant us humility that we may not exalt ourselves or treat our brothers and sisters with contempt. Rescue us from every evil and bring us into your kingdom as your beloved children. To you alone be all glory, O Father, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. 
we lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Oh, oh, oh. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Oh, Christ, the Lamb of God, that takes
The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. He is good, and his mercy endureth for heaven. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Blessed we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
You may be seated. Good. <laughs> you already took advantage of that. Uh, so again, uh, going to be gone for three to five days post-op, hopefully. No other complications. Keep Naomi in your prayers. I guess patience for us, too. Um, if you have an emergency need, I've got pastors on call. Just reach out to me, and I'll make sure um, the appropriate person can take care of you or, or those that you love. Uh, let's see. We have, in a week from Monday, we have the uh, back-to-school potluck picnic. I think that's what they're calling it, yeah. And uh, you're all welcome to that. That's a great opportunity for you uh, to meet the teachers. You'll have another opportunity, though, on the 10th. Did I get the date right? September 10th for, this, for the picnic. Yeah, the church picnic. So there's a school picnic and there's a church picnic, and the church picnic is also the school picnic. Kind of confusing. Lots of picnics. Come, have food and fellowship. Um, meet, meet some of the students, too. Not all the students and families, majority, aren't uh, members of our parish. So that might be one of the few opportunities you have um, to get to know them and encourage them uh, to maybe come and visit us sometime. All right. Uh, we do have Bible class today, so come for that. And uh, I'll try to keep it brief because it'll probably be warm. Is it getting warm? Like I said, you could be in Nebraska or in the south, right? Or you could be on Maui. That's tragic. Uh, by the way, with Maui, um, some difficulty getting relief to people, but I posted on Facebook a collection of links where you can support families directly um, or some of the local agencies that are um, confirmed to prov be providing material needs to them. Um, that's going to be a long project. I mean, it'll probably take years just to remediate all the toxicity of the land. Um, so many, you know, 1,000 plus probably are homeless or more, plus all the dead who are grieving, so we grieve with them. Um, let's see. Oh, after Bible study, then go to Piggly Wiggly in Plymouth uh, for groceries? No, for uh, Brat Fry to support uh, Brad Yanch, who uh, is still in need of surgery, right? Um, transplant, yep. So go and support them, uh, if you can make your way up to Piggly Wiggly this afternoon. It's only until 2, right? Yes, okay, only till 2. So, all right, that's it. Lord be with you all. Uh, try to stay cool. How about that? <laughs>